pleasure to introduce uh, Timothy Kim. Uh, he comes from the Department of uh, Mechanical Engineering at the uh, University of Michigan. Uh, before that, he was uh, working with uh, Samsung, and uh, before that, he received uh, BS and uh, MS degrees from Mechanical Engineering from Seoul National University. Uh, he's doing a good version of all the dictionary uh, health monitoring of uh, systems. Uh, the majority of his presentation focuses on uh, circuitry, synthetic based uh, structural health monitoring, uh, but uh, he wants to extend that to predicting critical transitions in complex systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. I look forward to your work. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce some of my research um, in front of you today. And basically, I'll be talking about a new method of enhancing the impedance space of damage identification by using an integrated, bistable, and adaptive piece of circuitry. This is the outline of today's presentation. First, I'll start with some background information and introduce the problem statement and goal of this research. And then I'll introduce um, new concepts of impedance data enrichment and bifurcation-based sensing to address uh, this problem. And I'll end my talk by summarizing the contributions and impacts of this research and my future plans. First, let me start with some background information. The figure here is Figures here show some recent uh, catastrophic failure in structural systems. For example, the figure on the top left shows an uncontained engine failure of a Boeing 737 in Ad that happened in Atlanta uh, last summer. And uh, this is a collapse of bridge on the I-35 West in Minnesota that occurred in 2007. And here shows a structural uh, failure of a wind turbine that occurs in California. And uh, these figures clearly show that there is a great need in advancing the system health management technology, which is directly connected to our safety and our economical benefits. And the system health management start with from damage diagnosis using structure health monitoring techniques. And when it's combined with uh, usage monitoring data, we can estimate how the damage propagates and also estimate uh, the, re the remaining useful life of this system. And based on these information, we uh, manage the whole system uh, by making decisions on condition-based uh, maintenance and operational plans. So we can see that structural health monitoring to diagnose the structural damage in the system is a first building block of this whole system management. And there are various methods to identify structural damage. One of the popular ones is the vibration-based method, which uses the vibration of data such as mode shapes, or natural frequency of the system to identify the location and severity of damage. <coughs> and the merit of this method is that it is relatively easy to implement and you can identify both the location and severity of the damage when a credible baseline model is combined. However, the limitation of this method is said that it is relatively, it is actuated in relatively low frequency range, so this method may not always be sensitive to small sized uh, structural damage. And another very popular method is a weight propagation based method. And uh, this, the merit of this method is that since it uses high frequency excitation, it is sensitive to small size uh, structural damage by its nature. On the other hand, uh, it is said that there is a limitation since um, the, this method can be very sensitive to uh, noise and it is, not, it is said that it may not always be easy to identify the severity of the damage. And recently, uh, a new method, so-called piezoelectric impedance-based method, has been introduced and has shown great potential for damage identification. And uh, this method uses 
the two-way coupling effect of a piezo transducer. So you can monitor uh, this the impedance uh, mechanical impedance change in the structure that is induced by damage by measuring the piezoelectric impedance change. And, and this impedance can be uh, simply measured by a voltage drop across this resistor in a simple circuitry like here. So the merit of this method is that it is relatively simple to implement for identifying the location and severity of the damage for a very small size structural damages. And uh, this impedance-based method can be uh, generally categorized into two classes. One is a database method, and the other one is a model-based, uh, physical model-based method. And one of the popular methods in this database method is to utilize the frequency spectra of this impedance response. So the merit of this method is that it is fairly straightforward for implementation since it is comparing the frequency spectra before and after the damage occurred, as shown here. But on the other hand, the limitation of this method is that it is relatively only uh, limited for detecting the occurrence of damage only, since the damage index is indicated by simply uh, quantifying the difference between uh, two different spectra. And there has been also many advancements in uh, comparing the time series response for damage identification. The merit of this method is that it, excuse me, it may be you know, useful for real-time monitoring and wireless applications since it has a merit of a light computation and fast processing. On the other hand, it is generally said to be limited, again, only to detecting the occurrence of damages. And there also has been um, a method using the pattern recognition uh, techniques, such as neural networks and uh, AI recently, to detect, uh, identify the damages. And the merit of this method is that <coughs> you can classify the damage uh, characteristic location severity based on uh, these methods. However, it is also well known that you need a large training data uh, with respect to all different kinds of damage uh, conditions in advance. And another class of method that I mentioned, the model-based method, is based on a physical model. So we are predicting the response of the uh, impedance of measurements and comparing that with uh, actual measurements. So it is generally solved in an inverse fashion, which is like uh, which means you want to uh, quantify, you want to identify the system parameters, which indicates the location and severity of the damage based on those measurements. And the merit of this method is that you can identify the location and severity of the damage even for new types of damage that is not uh, reported previously by using this physical model. And there are other merits such as you can do further analysis using this model, such as uh, self-diagnosis of the sensor, and also you can think about how, what is the optimal way to deploy the sensors, and et cetera. So there have been various approaches to uh, advance in this uh, direction. For example, there was a finite element uh, base and spectral element uh, method based model updating technique uh, to identify the damage characteristics. And there also has been a, a method to derive a sensitivity-based inverse problem, which also successfully identified the location and severity of damage while giving a better, a better uh, computational efficiency. On the other hand, there are some uh, still some room for improvement in this technique, since in general, this inverse problem is seriously underdetermined, which means that we have um, the number of measurements are generally far fewer than the number of um, parameters that we want to identify. And there has been a fairly little consideration on uh, the noise and uncertainty related to these problems. And this slide here shows 
the, um, an example of the limitation of this underdetermined inverse problem. And in case we, for ease of uh, explanation, if we consider a linear uh, inverse problem, shown here, this is model um, matrix and damage index we, that we want to identify based on these measurements. For an underdetermined problem, we generally use a, a shooting inverse, which basically truncates uh, the singular variable, the small singular variable values out. However, we can identify the, we can estimate the damage characteristics pretty well by using this uh, technique. But when there is an even very small amount of error included here, this becomes significantly amplified during this shooting inverse process due to a very, very small amount, small singular values in an underdetermined inverse problem or the rank deficient uh, matrices. So this damage, the true damage index gets easily uh, over, uh, overwhelmed by uh, this uh, noise amplified noise term and uh, damage index uh, prediction are uh, distorted. So this damage identification is extremely sensitive to even small errors in this kind of underdetermined problem. So the problem statement is that this inverse problem for damage identification is underdetermined, and it, what is even worse is that it makes the inverse solution extremely sensitive to even small amount of errors. And compared to that, there are uh, not many uh, efficient means to accurately measure the impedance uh, change due to damages, especially under noise uh, influences. So the goal of this research is to overcome the limitation, to develop a new method that can accurately identify the characteristics of damage in the damage in the, uh, the structure while still maintaining the simplicity of this uh, impedance-based method. And the new idea here is will be proposed to, to address the first limitation, which is uh, uh, the impedance data enrichment using an adaptive piezoelectric circuit. This slide will uh, show about uh, the procedure of uh, deriving a sensitivity based uh, inverse problem. And the basic idea here is to derive a delta D, which is the location and severity of the damage, in this case, the stiffness reduction in each element, based on del Y measurement, which is the damage induced impedance change from the structure. And for example, in this case, for, uh, say we have a beam structure, excuse me, and a piece of transducer is attached to this structure, serially connected to a resistor and a voltage source. And the generalized force and uh, displacement of the structure can be described <coughs> as the following. And based on uh, these uh, displacement voltage that occurs due to the coupling effect can be modeled. And by measuring the voltage drop uh, across this resistor value, we can obtain the impedance in our model. And after doing some uh, math, we can derive a first order uh, sensitivity equation as shown here. The matrix G shows a M by N uh, sensitivity matrix. Del Y is uh, an M by one vector of it impedance change measurements, and del D is the vector of damage indexes that we want to uh, identify. However, as I, as I mentioned before, this inverse problem because, uh, becomes underdetermined since the number of measurements are generally fewer than uh, the number of damage uh, indices, so we cannot accurately predict these uh, characteristics. So the new idea here is to employ an like, additional piece of transducer with tunable inductance, which is uh, fairly equivalent to adding another degree of freedom to this integrated system. So by tuning uh, this uh, circuitry element, we can change the dynamics of this uh, couple system intentionally. And as you can see from this here, we can change uh, equations. And the figure here shows the frequency response of this uh, um, coupled system. And we can 
clearly see that by changing the inductance value of systematically, we can greatly modify the uh, response of this coupled system. So by tuning the inductance systematically, we can have a family of inductance data, that uh, impedance data, that reflects the same damage. So the bottom line here is that we can greatly enrich the impedance measurements and have more information about the same structural damage. And so, for example, if we tune the inductance value to form a sequence from L1 to Ln, we can have a, a suite of these uh, inverse equations and put them into a matrix form like this. And we can clearly observe that for a identical structural damage, we have a, a series of information as shown here. We can greatly increase the number of uh, impedance measurements. And this inverse uh, matrix, uh, the sensitivity matrix, can be greatly uh, improved. And the figure here shows the rank that increases as we add more tunings into this uh, system. So the bottom line here is that by applying this new idea, we can greatly improve the originally underdetermined inverse problem. And here shows some numerical analysis for damage identification by applying this technique. Damage was modeled as a 10% stiffness loss at the 13th element of the total 31 elements. And uh, I have applied this data enrichment technique by uh, applying an adaptive circuit with eight different uh, tuning values as shown here. And the figure down here shows the damage identification result by using a conventional method without uh, noise influences. The horizontal axis here indicates each of um, the, the element number in this model, and the vertical axis shows the stiffness reduction of each uh, element, which I assume as damage. And this uh, dash uh, box indicates uh, the actual location and severity of the damage, which is 10% uh, stiffness loss at this 13th element. And by using a conventional method without noise, we could almost exactly pinpoint the location of severity. On the other hand, with a very small amount of noise, 62 dB SNR, the result goes bad with a conventional method. However, by applying this method, we could uh, pinpoint the location and severity again very well. And here shows experimental verification. Again, in this beam structure, I have applied a repeated measurement and data enrichment, and seven inductance tuning values were selected as shown here. And uh, the inductance value inductances are realized by using an open based uh, synthetic inductor. The figure on the right shows the comparison between the impedance uh, baseline model and the experiments. And here shows the damage identification result that I obtained through the experimental study. Again, the horizontal axis shows the number of elements that are discretized in the model, and the vertical axis shows the stiffness reduction in each element. And here shows the location and severity of the actual damage. And without any enrichment techniques, the location severity are indicating at a wrong location. In case, by just looking at this, we will say, oh, maybe that's the right place, but we don't know in advance, right? So as we apply more inductance values, we can gradually uh, improve this damage identification. And it fairly uh, pinpoints the location and severity very well. <coughs> and here shows damage prediction error uh, as the number of inductance tuning increases, which can be shown gradually decreasing. So from these results, we can conclude that this concept of data enrichment can improve the damage identification uh, in the experiment. Two questions. Mm -hmm. One is, when do you stop? When, when do I stop? Yeah. OK. So what? Um, I'll say 
So, so first, the way I apply this uh, damage, uh, inductance tunings, I haven't I explained that actually here, is that for example here, um, say this is this is a response frequency response of the structure. I uh, intentionally um, match the the electrical resonance frequency of the the light circuit with the mechanical resonance frequency of this uh, given structure. In that way, I decide the number, the value of this inductance tuning, such that this uh, the electrical uh, resonance match with the uh, mechanical structure. And for for example, in case I have a five uh, resonance in the range that I can measure, I apply tunings for each uh, resonances. So um, in in a short way, in that case, I would stop, if, if I'm very limited by budget, I will stop at five inductance tunings. But in case I have more resource to do that, I'll repeat that more and more gradually uh, to improve the performance. But the, the, the inductance value tuning, the effect kind of uh, saturates at, at the first uh, five resonance peaks that are in our uh, measurement range. And then after that, it gradually increases. However, the, the rate is uh, decreased compared to the first five. So if you ask, I'm very limited, but I want to have a very effective uh, tuning effect, I'll stop at the number of those uh, measurement points, the measurement peaks in the, in the range. Your tunable inductance is completely error and noise free? Okay. Um, compared to <coughs> this, uh, the structural response, I, I find uh, the inductance values are very uh, more uh, precise to, to uh, model it. So errors come from two sources. One is modeling error. The other is the, the measurement error, right? So the modeling error part, I, I, find, I, I believe and I find that it is much more, uh, the uncertainty, uncertainty comes in is much less. But the measurement part, there may be some errors, uh, measurement noise that uh, the tunable inductance uh, adds into the system. That is correct. However, I am using, I, the, the point is that the error that adds up into the system by this tunable inductance, the effect is fairly uh, less compared to the merit of uh, making this inverse equation full rank. So I, I haven't done a very rigorous uh, analysis, especially that has to be, to be done in the experiment, but based on my experience and my uh, intuition, this uh, making the inverse equation uh, full, full rank would be a much more beneficial compared to the small amount of error. Are uh, you, because every time you add a new line to this matrix of yours, you add a new epsilon as well, a new error. Um, however, that new, that say, that del delta and the, the epsilon plays, becomes very significant when it is seriously underdetermined. But as I add more of these, uh, these uh, inductance tunings, my, my system is becoming well-defined. So the, the, the amount that error plays a uh, bad, bad effect on the damage identification becomes seri uh, significantly reduces, reduced. Did it? Yeah. Okay. So next, I'll introduce a, another new idea to uh, uh, address the second limitation of measurement of defects. And the new idea here is to employ a bistable circuitry to improve the measurements. 
actually this uh, concept of bifurcation-based sensing is an idea that we borrow from the MEMS community. Uh, so, and the term bifurcation here means that it means a phenomenon of large qualitative change in the response due to crossing some critical parameter of the nonlinear system. And since the MEMS, MEMS devices have inherited strong nonlinearity, it was natural for the people in MEMS community to utilize this strong nonlinearity for bifurcation-based sensing and detect infinitesimal change in the, the mass or the response in the structure. And it has been shown that this method is less susceptible to noise and damping influences compared to uh, directly detecting the frequency measurements. So I wanted to use this advanced sensing technique into uh, structure of monitoring. But the problem here was that most structural systems are not uh, in a uh, strongly nonlinear regime, like big structures. So we, I needed an additional way to introduce this strong nonlinearity for bifurcation-based sensing. And the solution and the new idea <coughs> was to introduce a bistable circuit and integrate it to the whole structure so that I am introducing strong nonlinearity through a circuitry element. And here shows a typical example of an op-amp-based bistable circuit that is connected, integrated to the whole structure through a piece of transducer. So the structural response is picked up by this piece of transducer and is fed in, uh, in as an input voltage for the bistable circuit. And the important feature that I have used in this circuit was the saturnal bifurcation, which is a nonlinear phenomenon that uh, two equilibria system uh, collides each other as a parameter passes through its uh, critical point or threshold. And uh, generally, when uh, this parameter crosses this threshold, the dynamics jumps to into another stable branch. So we see a sudden increase or decrease in the response uh, as bifurcation occurs. <coughs> and in this system, the critical parameter was the input voltage level. And based on this input voltage, there was a big change in the uh, output voltage of the circuit. And here shows an example. For example, the input voltage was slightly uh, lower than the threshold, then uh, we have an uh, output voltage level that was oscillating around um, one of the stable equilibria, as shown here, with a low amplitude. On the other hand, if it slightly passes this threshold level, then the, the response level significantly jump into another branch of state, uh, another stable branch, and we see a drastic change in the response from here to there, a large amplitude oscillating between these two stable points. So based on this uh, input voltage level, there is a great drastic change in the response. And when I did further analysis, not only focusing on the amplitude level, but also the ampli uh, frequency of the input source, I could get a counterplot like here. The counterplot indicates the output to input voltage mapping ratio of this light table circuit. And the conditions in this dark blue colored area corresponds to a high orbit response as shown here. And the conditions in this light blue colored area results into a low orbit response. And there is a clear threshold between these two areas. And we, we can be we can naturally think that if there is a small change around this area, we will have a big jump in the response from here to there or vice versa. So we wanted I wanted to use this area for sensing and to detect the dynamic induced impedance changes. And we could I could tune this bistable uh, circuitry design to met, to play around in this uh, target range. And uh, this figure here shows the procedure of measuring the impedance change by using this bifurcation idea. Um, so the structural response is going to be the input to this bistable circuit that are picked up by a piece of transducer. And here shows uh, an example of a structural response of the healthy structure. It's a frequency spectrum in 
of the healthy structure in the blue color and the damaged structure in red color. And there is a trigger level um, in green line that I just explained before. So just in, a, in this case, if we excite the system with a fixed frequency uh, as this, this level and uh, harmonically, the response of the bistable circuit for a healthy structure may result into a lowered response because the amplitude level is lower than this threshold level. On the other hand, for a damaged structure, at the same frequency I'm exciting, but for a damaged structure, I may have a hybrid response. So I could use this uh, to measure what's the change in this uh, in uh, this healthy to damage difference. For example, if I apply an array of this bistable circuit with different threshold levels, I would, I would be able to have an array of responses for a healthy structure and damage structure. And as, you, and as I explained before, the response are very different from lower rate response to the higher rate response. I could think in like a <coughs> digital uh, way, and for example, if I mark, uh, map my lower bit response as zero and high bit response as one, these are the response of the healthy structure and damage structure. And the difference between these two, two responses array can be mapped back into the actual uh, amplitude change in the, on the real structure. So by using this uh, sharp transition information and comparing it, I could have a more robust measurement of the impedance change for damage identification. Uh, yes. Isn't frequency response function only valid for linear systems? Because you're using it over nonlinear systems here. Um, that's a good question. Um, this frequency response is of the target structure. Mm -hmm. So the tar target structure is, I, I assume it's going to be linear. It, and this is the whole idea of applying the bistable circuit, because this target structure is linear, for example, this table, it cannot go through this nonlinear behavior, but I am applying a bistable circuit and, and putting this structure response into this bistable circuit, and the bistable circuit has the, that nonlinearity that enables this jump and those things. So the, very, um, the, the key feature that I'm using is that there is a sharp transition in the response level, and I am making the measurement by tracking the onset of that sharp transition. And the problem here is that many perturbations such as noise and uncertain uh, 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 non-stationary effects in the, in the input level influences when and where this uh, jump occurs. And accurately knowing this bifurcation point is critical for our sensing purpose because I'm tracking the location of that uh, bifurcation point. For example, say the structure has no damage, no change at all, but just noise level change. Today I measured and yesterday. Today I bifurcation occurred here. Yesterday, tomorrow occurs there. And then that is an obvious false alarm for our sensing mechanism. So I have to accurately assess when it occurs based on these uh, environmental influence. So here shows an example of the bistable uh, of the bistable circuit with uh, such parameters that I have used for the experiment. And here, the excitation voltage of the, was harmonically excited with an increasing amplitude sweep to assess the influence of non-stationary into in uh, the input voltage and the. Uh, response here shows uh, the output voltage level as a function of the input voltage amplitude. And as we gradually increase the input amplitude, the out output voltage level gradually increases, like it follows this line here. And there's a sudden jump to another branch, which occurs here. So this is the point of bifurcation. And we can clearly see that as we increase the sweep rate of this uh, amplitude sweep, or otherwise, other other way, if we pass the bifurcation point very fast, then the bifurcation occurs later, delayed. 
On the other hand, when the sweep weight was fixed, for example, this uh, level, uh, 0.1 volt per second, if we add and have more noise in the input voltage level, the bifurcation occurs earlier, as you can see here. So this location of the sound of bifurcation is extremely sensitive to these stochastic and non-stationary influences. And here shows the bistable circuit and experimental setup and uh, the uh, theoretical model that is derived for analysis. And uh, here shows the response measured uh, experiment and uh, theoretically predicted by using this model. Here shows the res time response of when the AC input was applied with two different amplitudes. For example, 100 millivolt resulting in lower bit response, 500 millivolt resulting in higher bit response. And uh, this shows the output to input voltage uh, ratio relationship of the bistable circuit as I employed, employed a very slow quasi-static DC input sweep. And for example, here shows this horizontal axis shows the input voltage level and vertical is the output level. And as I gradually increased the input voltage level, there was a sudden jump to the, the, this different uh, location. And when I sweep it down, there's a drop in response. And the point here is the theoretical prediction, which is indicated by the uh, solid line, fairly uh, exactly uh, predicted well the experimental behavior. So you could have confidence in using the numerical analysis to estimate the experimental results. And and in this slide, I explain I'll, I'll, I'll explain a new advancement to predict the location location of the bifurcation point under these two influences of noise and non-stationary. And to do that, I, I derive a single parameter, stochastic uh, normal form, that uh, reduces both of these influences into uh, one term. Here, I have approximated the local dynamics around this uh, bifurcation point of the jump as a piecewise linear or piecewise smooth system, as shown here. And the stochastic normal form of a non-smooth uh, sample bifurcation was derived as the following the voltage, input voltage level was reduced into a bifurcation parameter, and um, this noise term was assumed as an additive Gaussian line noise. And to accommodate uh, the non-stationary influence, the bifurcation parameter was uh, modeled as a function of time, so it gradually increases or decreases. And after doing some change of variables, I could derive a a uh, single parameter normal form, which is born in a non-dimensional uh, space. And uh, I call this a sca scale noise strength alpha, which reduces both of these noise influence and uh, sweep rate into a single term. So instead of playing with two terms, I could only um, use a one term to do the analysis for predicting where the bifurcation occurs. And here shows some uh, numerical and analytical um, val validation of this uh, analytical prediction by using a, a numerical uh, verification method. So I have analytically predicted uh, this the jump events by using uh, by solving this uh, single term uh, normal form into a focal front equation and a Kramer's rate approximation. And uh, this analytical pr uh, prediction was verified by a Monte Carlo type uh, numerical solution for a thousand times. And here shows the mean of the mean of the escape time when the bifurcation occurred, and this is the standard deviation of these values. And it has been uh, done for various cases with various noise levels as an input amplitude sweep rates. And you can clearly see that this analytical results uh, predicts the numerical um, numerical results fairly well for a wide range of amplitude, uh, scale noise level alpha. And here shows just one example of a condition. Say uh, it was noise level was ten millivolt uh, RMS, and, and the sweep rate rate was forty millivolts per second. And the Monte Carlo distribution of the uh, escape events 
as a function of input voltage level was fairly well predicted by this analytical method. So we can use this analytical framework to estimate the onset of this element bifurcation under these influences. And here, here shows, again, on the escape distribution, probability distribution, as a function of input voltage level. And just for the ease of analysis, if, if here it was assumed as a Gaussian distribution since the, in, the in noise influence was assumed as a Gaussian. And for example, in case the input voltage level is lower than a certain value, say VA here, which is two standard deviations below the mean, mean of this distribution, there is a high chance <laughs> that the output voltage level corresponding to this input will stay in a low orbit response. On the other hand, as we increase the input voltage level that is larger than this level, then the response of the bistable circuit may have a higher response by uh, this uh, by probability. So we can think that we are measuring the bifurcate on the change of the structural, power, uh, structural response based on this sharp change in the response. So from changing, uh, the increasing the input voltage from here to there, we could, we could think that there will be a high chance of 95% chance of uh, jump around between these two uh, amplitudes. So this can be interpreted as a minimum uh, voltage resolution for this bistable circuit under noise and non-stationary influences. And for the case I just uh, previously introduced, uh, the noise level was this 10 millivolt and the sweep rate was 40 millivolt per second. The conventional way of detecting the amplitude level have, would have a resolution of 14 millivolt. On the other hand, this bifurcation-based method provides a 3.4 millivolt, which is more than 400% of improvement in the sensing resolution. And for other conditions that I have ran for the numerical analysis, the average was approximately 400% uh, enhancement. So by using this theoretical, theoretical approach, I could also determine what is the minimum uh, resolution of this bifurcation-based sensing under noise and non-stationary influences. And finally, I have combined both of these by stable and adaptive field of circuitry into a, uh, together for the final damage identification. So again, this, the data was enriched by using this inductive tuning value, and the impedance was measured by this by stable circuitry uh, scheme. And uh, there were two, two small amount of damage uh, assumed in model, and the noise level was more realistic in this case, 22 dB SNR. The figure here shows the damage identification result when we do not have any of these uh, techniques applied. So the damage location was indicated at wrong location and wrong severity. You can obviously see that. And when we only applied this uh, data enrichment technique, the uh, damage identification result could uh, predict uh, this location, but it is not accurate anyway. However, by combining these two into together, we could almost exactly identify the location and the severity of the damage. And that was just for one case. I have ran for 1,000 combinations of different levels of noise and diff, uh, location, combination of location, like one, one damage location and having also three damage in the model. And here shows the histogram of the damage identification error, and this is the number of each count. And, but when we only use this uh, uh, tuning concept, the, uh, the mode of this uh, distribution was approximately 95%. The damage error, uh, identification error was large. But by applying both of these two methods integrally, we could seriously, significantly reduce the amount of prediction error as shown here. 
So from these results, we can clearly see that the damage identification using this integrated by stable and adaptive circuit provides a much more accurate and robust uh, result. So now let me uh, summarize my um, advancement in this research. This integrated by stable and adaptive piece of circuit provided a fundamental insight on improving the underdetermined inverse problem, especially in this case for damage identification. And the bistable circuit that is created for sensing purpose provided a, is a key element to expand this advanced bifurcation-based sensing into various applications. And the new the normal uh, the novel uh, analytical framework to predict this uh, bifurcation the, the location of the bifurcation uh, under noise and non-station influences provide a simple and accurate prediction, and it can be it can also provide a fundamental understanding of what is the sensing limit of this bifurcation-based sensing. And let me conclude my talk by. Uh, talking about my future plans. And uh, here is my vision as a faculty member to advance uh, state-of-the-art system monitoring and sensing strategies for a more sustainable and resilient uh, structural health man management. <coughs> and the first direction that I would like to uh, take is to enhance the reliability of structural health monitoring so that it can apply to more widely in practical applications. And the bifurcation, I, I plan to pursue uh, advancing the nonlinear uh, sensing techniques, including this bifurcation-based sensing, especially expanding the applications such as into MEM sensors for HVAC systems. And I also plan to develop a um, novel qualitative and quantitative method to predict uh, the critical transitions, such as cell bifurcation in a uh, complex system uh, by using the insights that are gained in my uh, doctoral research. <coughs> this could be applied to uh, ecological systems to <coughs> lay or L4, L4 clutter to predict when those things happen. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. <coughs> yes. So the and the adjustable inductance piezo, what is that actually physically doing to the system? Um so So here this this is this piezo electric transducer it is um, if we make an analogy of in mechanical systems, it is adding a mass spring, mass spring, not a damper, just a mass string, mass and spring system to a structure. So I am changing the tunable inductance values, inductance value, which would be corresponding to the mass value. So I'm, I'm adding an additional uh, degree of freedom to the whole structure, and I am changing that mass value. And you can do that. Uh, mechanically, but think about changing the mass value like systematically. This this would be a more efficient way to do that. Um, so what that makes you understand? Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. How did you go about picking the specific inductance values, the tunable? I don't know if you mentioned that or not, but um, that was done. Uh, I can use it. so. As I just used that mechanical analogy, mm -hmm. say it is, I am matching the resonance frequency of that additional system to the resonance frequency of the base structure. So it is like a, um, say, mechanical vibration absorber or that kind of concept. In that way, you have maximum uh, interaction between those two. So in, in, a, in a standpoint that I want to change the structure of the total system, that way is the most efficient way to do that. So in, uh, in a uh, 
circuitry way, I match the resonance frequency of this equivalent circuit to that uh, mechanical one. Yes? You mentioned the medical applications. Medical applications. Uh, often um, it involves salty environment. You have to measure from some parts of the body and so on. Would this work in salty ionic environment? Um, this, well, this, this means the tunable inductance and concept. And the piezoelectric. Uh, and the piezoelectric. Mm, I, I would say it, it will uh, apply depending on how you, how you attach your piece of transducer or you, you use that in, in the medical uh, environment. Um, like I, I was thinking about corrosion of the material, those kind of perspectives. But um, could you look, elaborate a little bit more of, what, of the purpose? For that example, you, you have to overcoat the hydroelectric device with uh, say heroin overcoating. Mm -hmm. Would that affect all of these dynamics? Um, I don't think so. We could uh, we could uh, model that. Uh, into the into our equation as well, but um, the, that, those coding will may have a little effect in in the big big sense of changing the, the dynamics of the couple system. Yes. So the bistable circuits are those uh, starting to be more widely used, or why why would people not want the extra resolution from it? Um, the bi actually, by stable circuits, have not I, I don't I don't find that it has been used for this purpose yet. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm the one of the only ones who used the bi stable circuit for this purpose, activating the bifurcation on purpose and use that for sensing. But there there have been a lot of um, bi, bi stable circuit architectures. There, there, there should be, I, um, and that is one of the aspects that I plan to explore more. Here, I, I have used only one architecture, one type of bistable circuit, but there are other architectures that have minute different uh, characteristics. So, mm, yes, that so, is my answer. So you think it can be generalized to pretty much any sensor eventually? That is, uh, that is a great point, and... I, I think that we'll be able to use because um, many sensor sensors are like transducers. You change the temperature into voltage, whatever physical quantity into voltage. So that voltage can be fed into this bistable circuit, and you can use that to have a better resolution without using the bistable compared to without using the bistable. Yes. You mentioned this, uh, you did these uh, measurements uh, only on uh, linear surface, or have you measured also like a, a curved surface? Um, I, this was only done for a uh, flat surface. A flat yeah. surface. And yeah. what about the temperature? The temperature was stable, or you had difference in temperatures? Temperature had some uh, different, like depending on when I measure summer and, mm -hmm. and during the winter, it, it, it also... It, and also, so I believe in uh, moisture too. Yes. So you had like additional errors for that, no, um, additional air noise, or so. So yes, that is one thing I also like to discuss a little bit more. So, for example, that is uh, first of all, there are many studies who have measured those influences and made it like a table or equation. So we can use that to compensate those e effects in the model. That is one thing that we can definitely do. And the other thing is, um, so in, when you do in the field work, like in real applications, those kind of things happen. And those are the uncertainties that comes play into damage estimation. Mm -hmm. So one of my uh, future uh, direction is to attack those uh, uh, uncertainties that are definitely coming from what you have mentioned the, the moisture, 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 moisture. 
Yes. Have you tried to see how model error is affecting this? Yes. Um, so, um, definitely the modeling error affects. However, the model and modeling error could be also mitigated by using this tunable inductance value because the modeling error can be uh, mathematically modeling error could be uh, uh, by by doing some math you could change that uh, error from the model into and regard it same as the error coming from the measurement. So we could clearly understand that the measurement error, the effect of measurement error on the damage identification gets lessened when we have a full rank, right? So the modeling error played could be uh, could be addressed in the similar way. That, that was actually public uh, in, included in my uh, paper. So uh, maybe I would I I'd be very happy to discuss about that. Explain that here too. <clears throat> so is there anything in your algorithm that estimates model in error or updates model parameters, for instance, or something um, along these lines? Or, because the way I see it is every time you add a new measurement, yes, you add more error. So here was the so here I have updated my baseline model to match the experiment uh, as much as possible. And after I get this baseline model, I have used this as uh, the model for damage identification. So uh, I have done that model updating for this uh, damage identification. And the, the, the one that I just mentioned before was, even if you do this, there is a modeling error, right? The, the error coming from the model. And that can be thought as, a, that can be equivalent to the error coming from the measurement in a mathematical way. You, you just change it to the, the other side. You just push it to the other side in, the, in, the, in that equation. And so that modeling error could be addressed by using this uh, data enrichment concept to make that underdetermined inverse problem more uh, full rank. Yeah, but I, I think yes. you, would, you would have to be careful because when you talk about measurement error, yes. um, you typically, let's say you know some bounds within which you're, you're sensing is correct or incorrect. And yes, if, if I think about this, about, say, some least squares problem, right? Yes. There's always going to be measurement errors when yes. I add more points. But if I add more points, that improves my prediction, right, my, my linear regression. With the model, though, right, if we're talking about truncation error, then you can assume that, you know, it stays within some limits. But if your model is correct in certain range of operation, but then it's totally off in some other range, then I don't know that you can, again, make that sort um, of uh, argument. And I think in this yes. case, it's a linear system, so it's yes. probably... Yes. Um, for, for both of your um, comments on uh, the modeling error, I, I totally agree that this is a model base, and the fundamental uh, weak point of this model base is what if the model doesn't match with the real, real right. system? And to address that a little bit, I, I have tried to uh, update the model as close as possible, and that damage, uh, data enrichment technique also mitigated some of the modeling error effect. However, still, I um, it, it is something that I, try, I, I want to address systematically in my future work to quantify, quantify those uh, um, errors and then est estimate, like, uh, accommodate those errors into my damage identification algorithm so that I can have a confidence in my final estimates. That is one of the goals that I'm uh, pursuing for my future, near future. So yeah, that, I, I guess I can make a quick comment here. For a stochastic error, right, this indeed you can move to the right hand side, assuming the error is bounded, right? So if you have really a model drift, uh, Jinky, uh, Kennedy actually can use the same approach to update the model as if the model has damage in it. 
to identify the discrepancy. That's exactly my question. So do you augment your D to account for model error? That's usually the first step in any model-based <coughs> yes. damage identification. So, so I, I guess George's question is, did you update your model first? Yes. Um, yeah, this is the, the updated model. So I updated my model first so that it matches well with the, the measurement. And while doing that update, all the Ds, uh, the, the damage of each element were, uh, I, I found a kind of like, say, baseline for those parameters. And then for a damaged case, there was a difference. So that difference was indicating what's the damage in that structure. I, that addresses your question. I want the same question in the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think the, 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 the question is really, if you have a really healthy structure, it's newly built, right? It's going to be different from, from your, your model, from your CAD model, right? So, so my understanding is that you can use this kind of technique to update your CAD model so that your CAD model prediction matches with your healthy response prediction. And then you use that updated CAD model as your healthy model yes. to do your stuff. Here, exactly. Right? That's that's actually that's how I did okay. for this whole work work. Uh, so if you didn't know where or how big the damage was, would you have to sort of guess and check all different possible spots? <coughs> No, um, that that is kind of the point of doing this damage identification. Um, uh, so, in the model, I because I, I modeled where the damage is, so mm -hmm. I know it. But in real case, I I wouldn't know where the, where the damage is. So I just run run the model, run this algorithm, and then get the results to to see if it matches with the actual. Is, was that the question? Uh, yeah, but I might, I might just be missing something fundamental. So, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think we have two circuits here. One is the data enrichment circuit and one is for the measurement. Mm -hmm. So here it can, uh, the advantage is you use two circuits here. I mean, why don't you directly add the inductance in your measurement circuit? Yes, that is also a good point. That is also viable actually here, but I wanted to um, uh, highlight the using two different techniques and combining it, and, and, and I have explained it this way. But yes, that is a definitely a point that is valid. valid. For, so, so for example, this tunable inductance can be applied here. So we have just one circuit for measurement and data uh, enrichment. Okay, we're out of time, so let's thank our